Welcome to the Timberlake Christian School podcast. Timberlake Christian School, founded in 1966, is a ministry at Timberlake Baptist Church. Our vision is to be a discipleship and educational institution for young people in order to develop them in a passion for glorifying God and train them for a life consistent with a biblical world and life view. For more information, check out our website at timulatechristianschool.org. Go Tornadoes! Welcome to the Timberlake Christian School podcast. Uh, My name is Jacob Hunter. I am campus pastor here at Timberlake Christian School, and this is a bonus episode for our Summer Family podcast series. Um, So all summer long, we've been recording these podcasts that are designed to be interviews with legendary figures from church history. We walked through interviews with William Tyndale and Martin Luther, and then we talked with Thomas Cranmer and John Knox, and then actually the last episode which will come out before this, but we haven't recorded it yet right now, is with John Calvin. Um, and so we've been walking through these, these great reformers, these men of the Protestant Reformation, and also learning the five solas as we went through, right? The, the five solas being um, sola scriptura, and then sola fide, sola gratia, sola Christus, and soli deo gloria. Um, scripture alone, faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. And we've been walking through these foundational truths that are so important for our faith. And so I wanted to, to take a step back today and record a little bit of a bonus episode to interview the guy who actually helped with most of the research for this project, and that is Dr. Ben Eswine. Um, so Dr. Eswine is uh, a history professor at Liberty University. He specializes in the history of the Protestant Reformation um, and, and church history there. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and what you do, Ben? Sure. Thanks, uh, Jacob, for having me. And I feel uh, you got all these great names, and then you got like the B team, which is uh, uh, me, Ben Eswine. So I'm here to uh, try to try to do my best. Uh, but ultimately, uh, what I look at specifically, or what I uh, my work has been on throughout my career so far, has been on uh, the reformers and how they uh, adapted the word, the the Bible specifically to. Uh, the different cultures of Europe, uh, and how it spread out from there. And really the early missions movements, the early uh, Protestant missions movements there uh, in, in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, uh, because uh, most people don't know that, but the Protestant Reformation actually began uh, the, those missions movements uh, in the 1500s. Nice. Um, so you are a member of our church, Timberlake Baptist Church. Yeah. Um, and you also serve with the school, right, on the, the board, I believe, the, yeah, the school. The board. Yep. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, and so in, in addition to that, at the church specifically, you help with an event called the Reformation Fair, right? Yes. And you put together these materials originally with these five reformers and the five solas, pairing them together in this way for that event. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Actually, it was uh, between um, myself and um, Pastor Matt, uh, and a couple other uh, volunteers who kind of came together and decided one year that we wanted to really highlight the Reformation, not only because uh, it's a seminal event and it's something that uh, certainly uh, should be looked at for anyone who's uh, in the church in America today, because it's part of the, really the founding of America, founding of the American church, uh, and specifically of, uh, you know, sort of the in, independent Congregationalist Baptist groups. Uh, it's really integral to our foundation, but also uh, as an alternative to other sort of uh, worldly pursuits that are done at that time, specifically Reformation Night, which is October 31st. That's when uh, Luther put the uh, 95 Theses on the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral by tradition. So uh, we wanted to celebrate that and highlight that as an alternative to other worldly uh, pursuits during that time. Yeah, okay. Um, so the Reformation Fair, an event we hold at Timberlake Baptist every year, it's been, what, three or four years now? Yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, it's it's been uh, yeah, at least four. Yeah, yeah at least four. Uh-huh. Uh, this will be the fifth, actually, I yeah, think. Yeah, and last year you had me dressed up as William Tyndale. Yeah. I had that big collar on. That was quite interesting. Yeah, you did a good job. That was, oh, that was, uh, that was weird. You looked good, too. Yeah, it was a big collar. <laughs> um, 
But, but just again, to, to emphasize, this material that we adapted for this podcast came from stuff that Ben had already put together for the Reformation Fair at the church. Um, so I'm just very thankful to him for allowing me to use the content and uh, being able to adapt it into this sort of podcast format for our school. Um, and I just would encourage you, uh, you know, more information will be coming out, I'm sure, early fall about the Reformation Fair at our church, the exact night. Again, it's always around October 31st, which we celebrate as Reformation Day. Um, and, and it's a great event, and it's just designed to be a fun event, but also a historical event to learn some of these, these great truths um, from the past. Um, so again, just thank you for all you do with that, Ben. Yeah, thank you. And you did a great job with this podcast. Certainly a large part of it was the way that you put it together, so you've done a great job. Well, thanks for the kind words. Um, but, well, actually, on that, I didn't do um, too much with it. We actually were really reliant on our actors throughout the podcast. <laughs> Um, so we had five different actors that came in, and those five actors did the voices of our five reformers. Um, and I was careful not to reference specifically who those people were as we went through to kind of keep the, the illusion, I guess, of, of the interviewing the reformers. Um, but just to give them credit, William Tyndale was played by Caleb Redlinger. He's an upcoming 11th grader here at Timberlake Christian School, did an awesome job. Um, and then we had Martin Luther. He was played by Grayson Fortney, who's an alumnus of our school. Um, his, his mom, Lisa Fortney, is, is our secretary here at the front desk. He did, just his German accent was pretty superb. I thought it was awesome. <laughs> yeah. uh, Ben's a purist, so he might not agree, but I think it was great. Um, <laughs> and then we had uh, Thomas Cranmer, who was actually played by Mr. Nathan Hill, um, who is our chemistry teacher, our, high, our secondary chemistry teacher here at the school. Again, he stepped in last minute for me and did a really, really good job with that. Uh, then we had John Knox, played by Caleb Bryant, Another upcoming 11th grader here at the school stepped in, really owned the role. He actually came in that day, Caleb did, and he would not stop doing his Scottish accent until the podcast was over because he was so afraid he would lose it. So he did a really, really good job. And then actually later today, we are recording our John Calvin episode with none other than the great Dr. Jeff Abbott, who is going to be playing John Calvin, um, just to give it that legitimate French accent, I suppose. Um, so really, it's just been a really fun project being able to collaborate with these men and, and to, to work together on helping people understand biblical truth through the lens of church history. So that leads kind of with that introduction to what I want to talk about today with you, Ben, which is just thinking about this. Maybe you're a parent here, you're listening, you, you've checked out a couple of the podcasts with your students, you think it's kind of weird, you don't understand why they're dedicating the time to this. Ben, can you tell us, as a, as a professor of church history, why a Christian should care about any of this? Why should we care about church history? Shouldn't we just read the stories of the Bible and just focus on what the Bible— I mean, obviously we want to focus on what the Bible has to say, but why should we also care about these great stories from the history of the church after the book of Acts? Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. There's uh, three parts I can talk to about that. The first would be uh, the— uh, commands in the Bible specifically uh, to teach our children about the events that led us to where we are today, to teach them those traditions, to teach them. And in the Bible specifically, when it mentions this, it's talking about the history of the events. And there's a reason why, therefore, a third of the Bible is history. A third of the books of the Bible are actually history books uh, and are accounts of the Israelites, of their kings, of the events uh, everything from Genesis itself all the way through uh, to the book of Acts itself. Those are all history books. Uh, of course, there are some prophecy books in there. Uh, there are some, uh, what, you know, what we call the, 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 um, the poetry books, things like that. I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about the books of history that are in the Bible. Uh, so if, if God has given us a, a third of the Bible to be history, then clearly it's very important uh, to him. And I think it is because he wants us to remember where we came from and he wants to remember, he wants us to remember uh, that, uh, you know, the, the dependence that we have on him. And that's only viewable by looking at the events and how that came about. So you can only find that in history. Uh, and so that's why it's so important in the biblical literature. So that's the first thing I would say. And I think it's important to God. If it's important in the Bible, it should be important to us today. Mm -hmm. And we have a historical yeah. faith, too. If, if Jesus Christ was not uh, an actual person who came and lived and died and rose again, if that didn't actually happen, uh, then, like Paul says, we're to be pitied. This is actually, yeah. you know, it's based upon First a fairy 15, tale. Right? First Corinthians yeah. 15, it's a fairy tale, but that's not true. These are actual events 
Uh, and so uh, we have to know our history as a result. That's a big problem in, in society today is a lack of understanding of history, of true history, what history actually says, uh, instead of uh, boiling it down to some sort of trope or some sort of uh, you know, ism, any of the isms that are out there, right? Uh, ra racism or sexism or something like that. The reality is, is that uh, history is about uh, the redemptive story of Christ. That's, that's much more prevalent and purposeful. So there's a purpose to history, and that's why we do it. So that's the first point. The second point uh, is uh, that if you look at history, uh, you can see the role not only that Christianity played in uh, salvation, in uh, the growth of the church, but also then uh, in the growth of society, in the growth of, of uh, culture. Uh, and specifically, uh, I would go back to the early church and the establishment of, of the historical narratives uh, by uh, men like Jerome and Eusebius uh, and Lactantius and these other major early Christian historians. Uh, they really set the tone for what history is. Uh, if you look at history before those guys, specifically, you'd have to go back to the Greeks and Romans, really, who are the ones who only, the only ones who truly recorded history outside of just some sort of chronology of events. Right. Uh, but, uh, and of course, the, the Jews as well with their books of kings. And, 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 but they are obviously within the Jewish tradition that was well accepted that history should be, should be taught because it was about, like I said before, the, the redemptive work of God mm. for his people. Uh, Eusebius and Jerome and others in, in, in the 4th century, they're doing the same for Christianity. They're making it into a study of, of the people of God specifically, but also of God working through those people. So they're the ones who establish uh, the martyrologies, uh, recording the martyrs who died for their faith. Uh, we wouldn't have that without Eusebius and, and those who did that. They who survived the great persecution of Diocletian, the last great persecution, uh, and they're the ones who record the martyrs. And without their records, we wouldn't know about those people, those, the, the great uh, saints who died uh, for their faith, by Nero, by all the different emperors who, who, who killed them. So, so they preserved that, and in preserving that record, they gave a whole new meaning to history that didn't exist in the Greeks and Romans. The Greeks and Romans, they recorded history as a bunch of fun stories. They didn't really critique those stories very well. If you read uh, Suetonius, for instance, or Herodotus, or any of these guys, they're just collecting stories and sources from different places. They don't have a critical mind. Uh, it's a little, little bit better, again, than attempts before that, but they don't have this, the critical mind that the, the Christian historians did. And they're really the ones in, in the fourth century there that begin uh, the study of history in it as a as a systematic critique of the world and of preserving the the Christian heritage there. So that was that's be the second point is that we we preserve uh, the Christian heritage by studying history uh, and how it's affected our our culture and our society mm -hmm. uh, and remembering the times of persecution and remembering the good and the bad. It's in in other words, it doesn't gloss over history. Yeah. And Eusebius and them, they never glossed over the history. Right. That's the second point there. Okay. And then the third point uh, is the importance of the Reformation specifically is probably uh, the most important event in the establishment of the modern world. Uh, that, oh. that we wouldn't have the world today without the Reformation and what not only Martin Luther did, but all the other reformers along with him. Uh, and that movement itself is one of the central uh, central. Uh, points that establish the world that we live in today. Okay, so three points you gave us. Let me just <laughs> recap it real quick. God cares about history, so so should we, mm -hmm. right? That's the first point. Why should we study church history? Well, God cares about history. We see that in the Bible, so mm -hmm. then we should care about history. Um, second point you gave us was that studying church history preserves our Christian heritage, mm -hmm. and we can see how Christianity has not only influenced the church, but culture and society as a whole. And then a third point you gave us is looking at the Reformation specifically. The Reformation in part, well, really not even just in part, but it's, it's a huge source of the modern world as we know it. So even just outside of a, a Christian uh, understanding of this, I mean, even if you weren't a follower of Christ, it would be important for you to know about the Reformation because it influenced the way the world actually is today. Absolutely. I think those are yeah. some really, really good points. Yeah. Um, I think another thing... 
um, to think about is, I think about Ecclesiastes, where um, the Solomon there says there's nothing new under the sun. And I think it was interesting for me, as I was learning more about these reformers and studying and, and working on the Scriptures podcast episodes, um, just to see, I could really uh, resonate with some of their struggles and where they came from and their failures. That's one thing we talked about a good bit before, is that these men from church history, um, you know, Martin Luther, John Knox, John Calvin, whoever the man is that we're talking about, even the Reformation specifically, even beyond that, men like uh, Charles Spurgeon after them, or the Puritans, or even before them, looking at guys like Thomas Aquinas, even in the medieval ages, um, all of these men were sinners, like, like we are, and we can resonate with them, and we can see how the Lord worked through them. Do you have any thoughts on that maybe for us? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's the key point, I think, is that none of them are perfect. Martin yeah. Luther is not perfect. Uh, Calvin wasn't perfect. They're, all of them had their flaws, uh, but they ultimately trusted in God. They went through some very tough times as a result of that, but their faith saw them through that, and ultimately, in the end, their, their lives uh, portrayed uh, a true Christian faith, I think, in, in many different ways. So they're, they're you know, examples uh, of, of men of faith. They're not the only ones. Like you said, there are others. Uh, but certainly what we see in the Reformation specifically is that these men were oftentimes either counter to the authorities at that time uh, or were working to better their local communities in ways uh, that had lasting impacts on those communities for centuries to come. And so to that extent, you can see how just a few faithful men doing what, uh, what they uh, felt be, through prayer, through their conversion, through uh, their writings was God's, God's work in their lives, that that uh, led them to uh, these mighty efforts that ultimately transformed their societies, broke down the systems of oppression and tyranny that were going on uh, in, in the Europe at that time, the, the governments at that time, and instead cause a renewal in, in, the, in the cultures there. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, I think a really important you know, point on that, even you brought this up earlier as well, is that the main character in church history isn't these men. It's not these reformers. No, it's it's yeah. God um, yeah. in Christ building his church. Absolutely. And doing what, what he has sovereignly purposed for his glory in history. Um, and so when we study church history... We're studying the story of how God has preserved his church, how God has preserved his gospel, how God has preserved right doctrine. And, and as you mentioned earlier, we're picking up this Christian heritage that's come before us, and we're able to carry that through to the next generation. Um, that's a really beautiful, beautiful thing if you think about it. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That's, that's, I mean, I think that the way that that was done in the Reformation gives us an example. Uh, and, you know, the things change over time, but to some extent, even as they uh, change, you know, God remains the same. If God remains the same in his message, the gospel remains the same. How do we communicate that uh, in, in, in our culture today? That's always been a great, a, a great question. And the Reformation, what these, what these uh, reformers did, uh, ultimately, uh, and it's, again, it's easy to see the parallels. It's not, it's not simply one person. It's, it's multiple people, so you know that there's something else there. Uh, you know, they're two very they're two different places. Knox is in yeah. Scotland, you know, Cranmer's in, in, in England, and, and their situations are so different. It's, it's strange that they all kind of end up in the same place, nonetheless. Yeah. Yeah. So something's going on there. What is that? Uh, one of the things is that they're, ta they're making faith personal, individual. Uh, they're making uh, these individual choices of conscience, specifically that the Holy Spirit works through your conscience and ultimately uh, directs you in your faith towards uh, statements of faith, the purposes of, of your faith in transforming your life and therefore standing up for what's right and, and, and what to believe in. That is different from what we see in history before that. Conversions in the past, before the Reformation, if you look at the Middle Ages or even into the, into the ancient world, uh, late Roman Empire, for instance, uh, they're all either mass conversions, where a whole group of people would convert because their leader usually converted. And of course, you have to question, okay, how much of that is genuine? <laughs> Many of it is just people going along with whatever uh, wh whatever uh, their, their leader told them to do. So there might be a few gen genuine conversions in there, but uh, a lot of people are just going along with, with the, the, the flow, so to speak. Yeah. And then you have others that are converting uh, publicly, a public conversion. A lot of leaders would do this 
uh, and sometimes we even do it at the end of our lives, like Constantine, who's baptized a few days before he dies, after mm -hmm. he's abdicated the throne, because he didn't think that he could be emperor and Christian at the same time in his mind. He, he, couldn't, he couldn't fathom that because, uh, one, he'd done a lot for Christians, but he'd also been an emperor and done a lot of political uh, power politics type uh, things, and ultimately Christians had always seen the emperor as sort of a, an evil figure, as as the antichrist even, so that you, he couldn't rectify the two. So he does this great conversion at the end of his life where he's baptized, and then, and then so it's very public, uh, but then you have to, you know, there's always debate on whether Constantine was a Christian or not as a result of that. So all of these previous conversions uh, are, are very hard in history to, to tell uh, how how effective they were, uh, mm -hmm. and certainly there's individuals that that show up. But in the Reformation, all of a sudden, uh, the, the men are uh, who who are the reformers are making it into uh, this this very personal uh, decision that people are showing through their Bible reading, their uh, statements of faith, and just like Luther standing up uh, mm -hmm. before the world and, yeah. and saying, you know, here I stand. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, and I think it might, it's a really, really good point to kind of head us towards towards the end of our discussion here. But just I'm reminded of, of our series we did in Colossians last year um, in Secondary Chapel. And uh, we talked at length about how these Colossian false teachers were coming in and they're adding in all these various cultural ideas. And they're saying you need these Jewish ideas, these pagan ideas, all these different things. And if you add those into the gospel, then you'll get the true experience of Christianity and, of course, Paul refutes that. He tells them to stand firm in the gospel, the simple good news of who Jesus is and what he's done through his death and resurrection, how all of the Christian life is lived in our union with Christ. I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful book. Um, and as we, we study that, and I'm thinking even about the Reformation off of what you said, these men in the Reformation changed the world. Like you said, modern society in many ways is an overflow of the Reformation. Um, these men changed the world not by trying to add new ideas, not by trying to go back to new things, um, but instead they were simply returning to the simple truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, in, in many ways, I mean, the, the whole central tenet that Luther had of justification by faith alone, that's just the core of the gospel message. That's all that is. And so he went back to this good news of Jesus. And when these men suddenly, um, like I said, had, had real regeneration, new birth experiences through their awareness of the gospel in the scriptures, they, they changed the world. Um, and so maybe that's an exhortation for us here. In, in, in our modern world, we're so tempted so often to go for so many new strategies and methods and programs and, and even new ideas, new ways of thinking. Um, we kowtow to different cultural standards that pop up at any, any given moment. And yet the, the real power of God, even as we read about in the book of Romans, is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, it is the power of God to save sinners like you and I, and it, it is God's plan for um, really uh, re restoring and redeeming the world through his church is in the power of his gospel. Um, and I think it's a really, really big encouragement. Any final thoughts on it's, that? It's transformational, right? And I think that that's the point, uh, is that it's, it's not something that's simply sort of an old axiom that you know, our, our ancestors used to follow or something like that, but it's a transformational power to actually make things new, and uh, that, that's what happened in the Reformation, too. Yeah, I mean, that's awesome. That's beautiful. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. S. Wine, for being here thank with you. us. Um, you. It's such a privilege to have you, and thank you again for all your help with, with preparing the materials for this podcast. Thank you again for all of our actors who helped us out with this over the course of this summer. Um, but I think that's all for us today, unless, unless Ben here has anything else he wants to say. I'm good. You good? Appreciate, appreciate you and, your, and what you've done to uh, see this along, for sure. Well, that's, that's all we have today. I guess we'll see you in just a few short weeks when school is starting. It's a scary thought, but it's starting soon. So until then, I guess I'll end just like I've ended all the other summer family podcasts. Semper Reformanda. <laughs>